Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Earth and Space Science 102. This is the fourth lecture of our meteorology segment. Today is a really, really cool lecture, very interesting lecture. Um, today we're going to be talking about thunderstorms and tornadoes, which have the potential to form in some thunderstorms that have an internal rotation. So not every thunderstorm is going to be capable of forming a tornado, but we'll talk about the ones that can. Um, you have to think about everything that we're going to talk about today, both the thunderstorms and the potential for tornado formation in the broader context of the global circulation of the Earth's atmosphere and in these things called mid-latitude cyclones. So we talked about at the very end of the last lecture, lecture three. In mid-latitude cyclones, you have different types of fronts, cold fronts and warm fronts, and particularly along cold fronts, you're going to have a mechanism to take the warm, humid air on the Earth's surface and force it up into the upper atmosphere. So you can form thunderstorms without that need of the mechanism, that cold front as a mechanism to form the uh, thunderstorms. They're just going to be um, a little bit, uh, li you know, a little bit more difficult to actually pinpoint exactly where they're going to form on the Earth's surface. Before we talk about any of that, before we get into the different types of thunderstorms, I wanted to start off today with a really sort of broad general definition for a thunderstorm. A thunderstorm is going to be any storm that's going to be capable of producing lightning and thunder, and one that maybe has the capacity to form hail, high winds, and really heavy, sudden downpours of precipitation. They might even, although it's not a requirement in every thunderstorm, have the capacity to form tornadoes as well. So beyond that definition, what I wanted to get started with today is a distribution map of thunderstorms across the United States. To give you a little bit of context here in South Louisiana of how much more common it is for us to get thunderstorms than almost anywhere else in the United States. Thunderstorm distribution is very, very localized here in the whole Gulf Coast region with the greatest number of thunderstorms existing in places like southern Florida and all through the Gulf Coast region and substantially fewer thunderstorms everywhere else in the United States. So something that we take for granted that's a very, very common occurrence here in South Louisiana would be practically apocalyptic anywhere else in the United States. Take a look at this distribution map. You can see that the dark blues and the greens, the higher percentages of thunderstorm formation are very much localized here in southeast Louisiana, southern Florida. We have far, far more thunderstorms than anywhere else. Now, you can have a cold front in many of these other different areas across the United States, and those cold fronts are going to allow for some thunderstorms to form. We have more thunderstorms in this region because we have a source of warm, humid air coming off of the Gulf of Mexico, and for southern Florida, that's off of the Caribbean. And then that warm, humid air is ultimately unstable on the land surface, and it always wants to rise up in the upper atmosphere and form thunderstorms. Now, as you get further and further and further out to the west, you have increasingly few thunderstorms until when you get to Southern California, especially along the coast, you have incredibly few thunderstorms form over there. I actually have some family that was in uh, last Christmas uh, the, from Southern California, and they came in right in time for a thunderstorm, and they really thought the sky was falling. They really thought that was a huge deal, and I was driving through it like it was nothing, you know? So, uh, it's, uh, it's very much dependent on your location where you're going to get uh, more thunderstorms versus fewer. I also wanted to point on this out on this map as you look at uh, central and eastern Colorado, that little blip on the map where you have that 50% uh, line um, for thunderstorm formation. You have somewhat uh, higher incidences of thunderstorms right up against the front range of the Rockies. And this is because you have a physical mechanism to take that warm, humid air on the Earth's surface and push it up into the upper atmosphere, where in other places you don't have have that mechanism. So it's not just cold fronts that are going to allow for thunderstorms to form. Sometimes it's a physical barrier that takes the warm, humid air and allows it to move up that barrier and essentially do the same thing as a cold front. So before we get into cold fronts and single mass versus multi-mass thunderstorms, we're going to first talk about the basics behind what lightning and thunder is and why it happens. Lightning 
is a discharge of electricity from typically one point in the cloud to a different point in the cloud. Only a fairly small minority of all lightning is actually going to make contact with the ground surface. The reason why this happens is because air in general and the moisture in the Earth's atmosphere present in clouds is just a really, really terrible conductor of electricity. So as clouds form, they do so by starting off at the lowest level, around a mile away from the Earth's surface, and forming straight up into the upper atmosphere. And if they form rapidly enough, this allows for a charge differential to develop. One part of the, ch the cloud becomes more positively charged, another part Part of the cloud becomes more negatively charged. And this increases and increases and increases until electricity is going to move from one point in the cloud to a different point in the cloud. It's basically the same thing as when you walk in socks across a carpet um, and you generate static electricity and then you get a little tiny shock. The difference here is that in a cloud, you can develop an incredible variation in electrical potential. And so that lightning ends up being just like a, a much, much more substantive version of that um, uh, static spark, that uh, static electricity. So the majority of all lightning is taking place within the cloud, and because the sound from that lightning has a limited potential. We typically don't even really um, hear it, but you can see it from great distances. It's what most people refer to as heat lightning, even though it doesn't really have any more to do with heat than any type of lightning does. You just typically can't really hear the sound from it. You can't hear the thunder from that event because it's too far away and too far up above the land surface. It's all taking place within the cloud. Cloud to ground lightning does actually produce thunder that you can hear at least from a few miles away. So the next thing we're going to talk about is what that lightning bolt actually is when you're dealing with cloud to ground lightning. You typically always sort of want to think about it from our perspective on the Earth's surface as something that's coming down from the cloud, like the rain is coming down from the cloud. But that's actually not what's going on. Lightning is actually taking place, the part that you can see is taking place from the ground up. So this is what happens. In a cloud, you start off with a more negatively charged portion of the cloud and a more positively charged portion of the cloud. And in the demonstration that I'm going to use in these pictures that I'm going to use to describe this, you see that the lower part of the cloud is more negatively charged and the upper part of the cloud is more positively charged. So this allows for that difference in charge to develop and the potential to form lightning is there. So if it's going to take place with the ground surface, what the ground surface does in response to having the lower part of this cloud be more negatively charged is that the ground surface actually becomes more positively charged to try to make up for that imbalance. And because you're dealing with solid objects on the ground, possibly even metallic objects, and the um, of something like a lightning rod, but it doesn't even have to be a metallic object. It can be you standing out in a field or it can be a tree. Whatever that object is that possibly might be raised from the ground surface, it's going to become more positively charged to make up for that imbalance. Now, negatively charged particles, electrons, are going to flow from the cloud down to the ground surface, but they're not going to flow in a straight path. They're not going to go straight down like gravity would force rain. What they're going to do instead is going to take the path of least resistance, electrically speaking, and so that might be a forked path. Those electrons might take one path, decide to abandon that path entirely and take a different path. And so you end up taking somewhat of a crooked uh, route for these electrons to take from the cloud down to the ground surface until they make contact with either the ground surface or maybe some object on the ground surface. Hopefully that's not you. Maybe, hopefully it's more something like maybe like a tree or a lightning rod. Then, now that those, the path of those electrons is established down to the ground surface, the positive particles can flow back up that same route and then, as this happens millions and millions of times in a single second, you have the charge imbalance start to be a little bit more um, uh, uh, fixed, in a sense. You have less of an imbalance because the bottom part of that cloud becomes more positively charged because of the flow of the positive particles back up that same path. 
Okay, so in terms of terminology here, the path of those negatively charged particles from the cloud down to the ground surface is referred to as the stepped leader. Think about those negative particles as paving the way down to the ground surface. The flow of the positive particles back up that same path is called the return stroke. And in terms of what you can actually see when you're thinking about lightning, that's the part you can actually see. So the lightning that you can see, it's actually moving from the ground up, but it's moving so incredibly fast that we don't have the, the ability as humans to actually perceive whether that lightning strike is taking place from the cloud to the ground or from the ground back up to the cloud. What's actually happening is that it's coming from the ground back up to the cloud, but it's happening so fast that you can't really tell the difference. You just typically sort of want to think about it from the human mind as something that's coming down from the cloud like Zeus throwing lightning bolts from the cloud or, from, or rain coming down from the cloud. You, you want to think about this as something that's coming down to the Earth's surface and not the reverse because, you know, mentally that, that makes more sense. So the stepped leader is the flow of the negative particles down to the ground surface. The return stroke is what we actually see. And this return strike, this lightning strike, is this rapid, rapid flow of all of these positive particles that actually heats the air. It vastly, vastly increases the temperature of the air, so much so that all the particles that make up the air have to expand rapidly. And when that happens, when you have the rapid expansion of the air due to the heat associated with that lightning, that creates a wave that travels away from that bolt of lightning. And that's what we hear as thunder. So the thunder part of a thunderstorm comes in by what you actually hear. And because the speed of sound is substantially slower than the speed of light, the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, and the speed of sound is about 0.3 kilometers per second. It's a pretty big difference. You see the lightning far, far, far quicker than you actually hear the effect of that, which is the thunder. So because of that speed of sound, 0.3 kilometers per second, or if you prefer miles, 0.2 miles per second, that sound is going to travel outward at a fairly slow speed. So that if it's traveling over a couple of miles, it might take upwards of 10 seconds to reach that distance. So let's say right now, while this is being recorded, we uh, have some lightning in the vicinity of this area. Let's say two miles away, you're going to have a lightning strike. This is going to create a sound wave that travels outwards in all directions. And by the time it reaches us here, we might have seen the lightning first, but we have to wait about 10 seconds before we actually hear the thunder because the speed of sound is so much slower than the speed of light. So as we um, count, it's not like you maybe grew up thinking, or at least this is how I always grew up thinking, that you count. You count one, two, three, and that's how many miles away the lightning is. Because lightning, I'm sorry, because the sound is actually traveling slower. It's traveling at about 0.2 miles per second. You have to count to five before it's a mile away, in a sense. You count to 10 before it's two miles away. And if it's any more than around three miles away, that sound wave has attenuated so much and it's traveling over such a larger area that you're probably not even going to be able to hear it anymore. The other thing that's gonna be affected by this is the type of thunder that you actually hear. Now, if lightning were to take place right next to me right now, what would actually happen is that you would hear this crack of thunder. And that's because the sound was traveling from a point very, very close to me. <clears throat> and so you're going to hear that thunder is basically just sort of one immediate sound, that crack of thunder. If it were a couple miles away, those sound waves would be traveling from multiple points along that single bolt of lightning. And then as those sound waves were traveling from all of those points, they'd reach you at different times. And so you hear sort of more that distant rumble of thunder. And that's just going to come from having that lightning bolt take place at a larger distance. If it's even further away than around about three miles, you won't hear the, the thunder at all. So what you could kind of take away from this, the moral of the story is if you're in a swimming pool and you think, I, I have a little bit more time than this, I'm just starting to hear the thunder, you want to go ahead and get out of the swimming pool. If you can hear thunder at all, it's taking place probably within three miles of you. So 
it's not worth it. It's not worth it to be in a pool. You want to get out of there as, as rapidly as possible, even if you're just hearing it from a distance, because the th the lightning isn't taking place. Like I always like to think when I was a kid and I was out in the pool, it's not taking place 10 or 15 miles away from you. It's within at least a couple miles from of you, if you can hear it at all. Okay, so now we're going to move on from what lightning and thunder actually is to different types of thunderstorms. And the way I like to describe this in the context of this class in southern, in southern Louisiana is thinking about this in terms of what kind of thunderstorms we get at different points during our year. So I want to start off with the, the very, very simplest type of thunderstorm that in textbook vernacular you might hear referred to as an air mass thunderstorm or a single cell thunderstorm. In these single cell air mass thunderstorms, you typically have a thunderstorm form because you have hot, humid air on the Earth's surface. It's always unstable. It's always low in density, low in pressure. So it always wants to move up into the upper atmosphere. And essentially, wherever it does, that's where you're going to form a thunderstorm. As the warm, humid air rises upward, it gets into a part of the Earth's atmosphere that's colder in terms of temperature. It's going to be colder, and therefore all of that moisture is going to want to condense. It starts to form clouds. It starts to form vertical clouds that end up with a charge differential, and then you have a little bit of lightning take place. So you might end up with maybe a half an hour of lightning and thunder taking place and a lot of kind of sudden downpour, and then the cloud's basically gone. It's rained itself out, it's destroyed. And so the stages there are that first stage where you form a cumulus cloud. It's sort of the juvenile version of the bigger, scarier, taller cumulus clouds. And then you end up dissipating that entire system because all of that rain means all the moisture, all of those tiny little droplets of water that actually made up the cloud are basically gone after a half an hour of rain. <clears throat> Okay, so if you're thinking about what kind of thunderstorms uh, or what times we get these types of thunderstorms forming, think about in July and August and maybe even into September in southern Louisiana and the fact that we never ever seem to have a day over those months where you don't at least have something like a 20 or 30 percent chance of rain in the afternoon particularly in maybe like late July and early August, it's so hot across South Louisiana and across the Gulf of Mexico that if we have any kind of moisture at all coming in off the Gulf of Mexico, by the late afternoon when temperatures are warmest, this air is going to have heated up. It's going to rise up into the upper atmosphere and sort of spontaneously, sporadically across South Louisiana, you have these little pop-up thunderstorms. So you might be in New Orleans, you might have a beautiful, beautiful day. It might be hot, but at least in terms of rainfall and clouds and everything, you might not have a cloud in the sky. And then by maybe 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you start to have some sort of patchy clouds develop. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, you might have a thunderstorm pop up. You might get really, really sudden heavy rain for 20 minutes or a half an hour. And then as quickly as it came, it dissipates and then you have beautiful weather for the rest of the evening. It's almost impossible to predict exactly where on the Earth's surface this moisture is going to rise up into the upper atmosphere, and so all the weather forecasters can really do is just say, well, we've got a bunch of moisture over this area, and we don't know exactly where those thunderstorms are going to form, so for that entire area, we're going to say we have maybe a 30% chance of rain for the afternoon, a 30% chance of scattered thunderstorms. You've probably heard that a lot whenever you watch the weather. <clears throat> These are pretty simple, and the reason why they're called single cell or air mass thunderstorms is because you're only dealing with one overall cell of convection. You have one little parcel or thermal, one little cell of hot humid air that's moving up off the ground surface and up into the upper atmosphere. And as this happens, you have all that moisture going into the upper atmosphere, cooling, condensing, forming clouds straight up vertically, and then those are thunderstorm clouds. And then as quickly as they develop, the rain starts, the lightning and thunder starts, and then it's gone. So you only have that one cell to deal with. And while these things are sort of annoying to us, particularly because you can't pinpoint exactly where they're going to form, they're not particularly dangerous. You certainly don't really have high winds. You don't have lightning taking place for hours and hours and hours associated with these single-cell thunderstorms. 
In order to form what's called a multi-cell thunderstorm, you need typically some kind of driving force that's going to take whatever warm, humid air is already on the Earth's surface and force it up into the upper atmosphere. Now, the perfect thing here, and the thing that's going to actually allow for these things to form in South Louisiana, is a cold front. So in order for us to get these multi-cell thunderstorms, these more complex thunderstorms that form along a line, this is less something that's going to happen in our late summer kind of weather and our July and August kind of weather, and something that's going to be more typical across the winter months. And December, January, February, it's very typical for us to have sort of like maybe kind of a almost muggy, uh, very drizzly, cloudy few days where the temperature's sort of warm. And then a cold front pushes through. You have a line of severe thunderstorms for maybe up to an hour most. And then those clear through and it's replaced by cold, dry air. This is the cold front portion of the mid-latitude cyclone forcing its way through our region. And after it does, that warm, humid air that was on the Earth's surface is replaced by cold, dry air. So that gives you a little bit of insight into the really chaotic nature of our winter weather in South Louisiana. We're either on one side or the other of these cold fronts. On the forward side of that cold front, you have the warm, humid air, you have kind of muggy weather, you have uh, high humidity, you have lots of, um, uh, you know, non-rain forming clouds potentially. And then as the cold front passes, that's when you get the vertical cloud formation, that's when you get the thunderstorms. So it's not rare at all for us to have, again, those sort of warm, humid days, um, warmer, humid days. I mean, you know, it's still January, so temperatures aren't going to be too warm, but temperatures may be up to around 70 degrees, but you have cloud cover, and then for those clouds to push through. So again, as the cold front pushes through, the reason why it can continue to form thunderstorms is because that pressure front, that cold front, acts as a barrier, a, a, a shovel almost, that takes the hot, humid air on the Earth's surface and forces it up into the upper atmosphere and replaces it on the surface with a more stable, cold, dry air that's at higher pressure. So as these things continue to form, you take the warm, humid air, move them straight up into the upper atmosphere, and you form a line of thunderstorms. Now, this is something that you've absolutely seen before, especially associated with our winter weather. Anybody can pick a cold front out on a map, and anybody can tell that that is going to be associated with a change in temperature, warmer temperatures on one side, cooler temperatures on the other side, and it's that change in temperature, in a sense, that's actually creating that line of thunderstorms. So when you see that line of thunderstorms come through, it looks almost like a marching army on a weather map, on a radar map. You see that line, that very distinct line of thunderstorms that are passing through fairly rapidly, and the entire line of thunderstorms might be the width of a single parish in Louisiana. It might be something like 30 miles across. Then as they pass, that's the extent of the weather. So it's possible to predict with fairly decent accuracy exactly when during a day you're going to have the incidence of really, really high uh, rain and, and the chance of thunderstorms. It might be at one o'clock on a Tuesday because that's when you know that line of thunderstorms is going to be passing when that pressure differential that is the cold front is going to pass and continue to form those thunderstorms. Now, the reason why we call them multi-cell thunderstorms is because out in front of the cold front, you're starting to form the newest cell of the newest thunderstorm. That's the cumulus stage. Out on the frontal boundary itself, that's when you're in the slightly more advanced stage, the cumulonimbus stage, where you've actually taken all the warm, humid air and moved it all the way up into the upper atmosphere, and it anvils out on the top. And that cumulonimbus cloud is going to be the thunderstorm cloud. That's when it starts to rain heavily, and that's when the lightning and the high winds, potentially even the hail, is going to start. The reason why you form hail is because it's possible for the updraft associated with these thunderstorms to take the rain that would be forming 
and keep it suspended up in the upper atmosphere where temperatures are low. So it freezes and it continues to freeze water on top of that one um, parcel, that one you know piece of ice. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you form hail. <clears throat> So you get all these strong winds, you get your thunderstorm, you get your, your lightning, your thunder, your strong rains, and then out behind that thunderstorm, you end up with your, dissip your dissipating clouds. So I, I strongly urge everybody not to think about these cold fronts as a single line of thunderstorms and more like a line of thunderstorms that forms because of that cold front boundary. And then that line of thunderstorms essentially sort of dies out and is recreated again. So as the cold front pushes through, it's continuing to form thunderstorms. So the same thunderstorms that pass through eastern Texas are not necessarily going to be the same ones that are going to form over our region. It's the cold front pushing through and continuing to form those thunderstorms. Now, this can get even more complicated with a particular type of thunderstorm called a supercell thunderstorm. Under just the right conditions, at just the right time of year, you can develop an internal rotation within these thunderstorm clouds. This internal rotation is around five kilometers or three miles wide. And this internal rotation is called a mesocyclone. Cyclone always refers to an internal rotation. Meso is just describing the scale of that rotation, uh, a mid-range sort of ro uh, rotation. Uh, something like a mid-latitude cyclone would be a macro scale. Something like a little dust devil might be a micro scale feature. So this is in between the two. This is a mesoscale feature, a mesocyclone. So this internal rotation within the cloud is not exactly the same thing as the tornado, but that rotation can and does connect up with the ground surface, in which case that is the tornado. So the tornado actually drops down from a pre-existing rotation within the cloud. And sometimes these can be incredibly deadly. Sometimes these are going to have the capacity to have winds over 200 miles per hour, definitely over the capacity of a hurricane to spawn those kind of wind speeds. <clears throat> So the first thing I want to start off with here is how you get that internal rotation within these uh, thunderstorms, how you get a regular old thunderstorm to become a supercell thunderstorm. It starts off with something called the jet streams. The jet streams are going to form at the boundaries between each of those convective uh, cells in the overall global circulation of the Earth's atmosphere. So you had a cell of convection, something called a Hadley cell, from 0 to 30 degrees north, 30 to 60 degrees north, and 60 to 90 degrees north. That 30 to 60 degrees north and the boundary at 30 degrees with the next cell, you have a jet stream called the subtropical jet stream. This is a really fast moving column of air high up in the upper atmosphere. You have another jet stream between um, the uh, 30 to 60 degree rotation and the 60 to 90 degree rotation. And this is called the polar jet stream. So these jet streams are fast, fast moving columns of very, very cold air up in the upper atmosphere. And they don't really affect us directly on the Earth's surface. What they can do is enhance mid-latitude cyclones, and they have the capacity to create the wind shear that is necessary to build these mesocyclones, to essentially um, build the, the feeding cells for tornadoes. So if you have just the right circumstance, if you have this cold moving, this cold, uh, fast moving column of air up in the upper atmosphere, the jet stream, and it crosses over these mid-latitude cyclones that are pulling warm, humid air up from the Gulf, then what actually happens here is that those winds cross. You have cold air moving one way in the upper atmosphere. You have warm air moving the other way in the lower part of the atmosphere. And those sheer winds the winds moving against each other in an opposite directions create a rotation on the Earth's surface that's actually parallel to the Earth's surface, like the rotation of a tire would be parallel to the Earth's surface. 
So that's the first step. You have to have the jet streams cross this warm, humid air on the surface of the Earth. And in order for that to happen, you have to be at the right time of year. The time of year for that to happen and actually affect us and have the capacity to form tornadoes in our region is between February to March to April. It's fairly early on in the season, early on in spring and in late winter. In order to have the same thing happen in places like Oklahoma and Kansas, you need a little bit later because that's when seasonally these, these um, jet streams are going to cross over the warm, humid air a little bit further north. In order, in order to form tornadoes even farther north in places like the Dakotas, this is going to happen a little bit closer to uh, late May, early June, possibly even into July. So at whatever time of year the jet streams cross over the warm, humid air being drawn up into the mid-latitude cyclones, that's where you have the capacity to form tornadoes. So in this next picture, you see how those shear winds are going to develop the rotation. The cold air in the jet streams is going to be moving up off the Earth's surface, far up in the upper atmosphere. And this, you know, just for a sense of scale, is between 10 and 15 kilometers up in the upper atmosphere. The warm, humid air is going to be moving underneath it in the opposite direction, and you create rotation. When the thunderstorms and the cold fronts come along, they have a significant updraft. They can basically take that rotation that's existing on the Earth's surface and pick them up and embed them in the thunderstorm. Then you have a thunderstorm with an internal rotation that's now perpendicular to the Earth's surface. It's going to be 90 degrees from the Earth's surface. Then it has the capacity to drop tornadoes. So it's all fairly complicated. It takes a little bit of time to think about how that rotation gets embedded in the thunderstorm. But the important thing is that those supercell thunderstorms, the ones that spawn the most dangerous tornadoes, they're going to be restricted to a particular time of year where thunderstorms and uh, these tornado, um, these thunderstorms with the capacity to spawn tornadoes are going to be a significant concern for first us and then places further north like North Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas and then even further north, like up into the Dakotas. It also really helps to have flat land. The flat land in places like here in southern Louisiana, uh, north Texas, up into Kansas, Oklahoma, and so on, that's going to allow for a lot of that rotation to really get started because you don't have the effect of friction slowing down and deflecting those hot, humid uh, air masses from moving on the Earth's surface. So as soon as you have this rotation, you have the potential for that cloud to drop down thunderstorm, to, to drop down tornadoes in a sense, for that rotation to in a sense connect up with the ground surface. That's the part, the actual connection of that rotation within the thunderstorm down to the ground surface that is ridiculously hard to predict and probably one of the things that is the most lacking in understanding tornadoes and understanding how to uh, monitor these things and how to actually get across to the public that there is a significant concern and that you actually have a tornado making ground contact. So what they do is in the occasion where you might hear for a tornado watch to be called over a really large area, like maybe the, the entire viewing area for a particular broadcast TV station, the, the reason why they've called a tornado watch is essentially because they've spotted a thunderstorm with that internal rotation. That can be picked up on Doppler radar, that internal rotation. Even if it hasn't connected with the ground surface yet, you're essentially telling a public that with Within some time period, like 24 to 48 hours, you have thunderstorms in the area that have the potential to connect up with the ground surface and spawn those, those tornadoes. You have a thunderstorm with the mesocyclone, the internal rotation. And the occasion where either by seeing this on Doppler radar or by someone actually having seen this and reporting it to a station, you get a tornado warning. That's when a tornado has essentially just been spotted 
either by a member of the public or by um, Doppler radar. They actually see that rotation connecting down to the ground surface. And then that's a little bit more localized. That might be an, a, a small town. You know, like just Hammond might be under a tornado warning in the event that a tornado has actually been spotted in the area. And that's of a more significant concern than the thunderstorm having the potential to form that tornado. So at the bottom, and I just wanted to show you this very, very cool picture, at the very, very bottom of these thunderstorms, where you have this rotation present within the cloud, under the right circumstances, you can actually see the bottom of that rotation. This is called a wall cloud. Essentially, if you ever see anything like this, anything like what I'm showing you right here in this picture, you need to be particularly concerned because that cloud has the potential and is probably getting ready to actually drop down a tornado to connect down to the ground surface. So now I'm going to kind of segue from talking about the thunderstorms capable of spawning tornadoes to the tornadoes themselves. A tornado is essentially just another type of cyclone. It's a very, very intense center of low pressure that makes contact with the ground surface, so you have extremely fast moving winds around it. The scale of these things is really, really important. In the scale of something like a hurricane, you have an, a, a, a meteorological object, a hurricane, that might be the width of the state of Louisiana. And so the distance that that drop in pressure is acting upon is still a really large distance. So even if you have a very low pressure at the center of that system, you have a large distance for that drop in pressure to be acting on. And so you might have wind speeds that act accordingly. You might have 100 mile per hour wind speeds. If you had that same drop in pressure acting over the span of the inside of a tornado to the outside of the tornado, that might be less than a mile in total distance, probably far less than a mile. And so that means you have even faster wind speeds as a result. It's absolutely within the realm of possibility to have wind speeds greater than 200, maybe even 300 miles per hour when you're dealing with the wind speeds on a tornado. Now, the good thing about these things is that they're small, and so the path of destruction on the Earth's surface that they carve is relatively small compared to something like a hurricane. The bad news is that we don't have a really strong understanding of exactly what triggers their formation or how long they're going to stick around. They're extremely short-lived when you compare them to something like a hurricane. So it's all sort of good and bad news. Much, much faster wind speeds, much, much larger capacity for destruction than something like a hurricane, but they're smaller and they're more short-lived, so the destruction that they do cause is usually a lot more isolated. So the scale in which we use to describe tornadoes is extremely different than the scale that we use to describe hurricanes. So everybody, most everybody in South Louisiana is, is at least somewhat familiar with the scale that we use to, um, to measure hurricanes. It's called a Saphir Simpson scale. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. It's going to be based on sustained winds because that is actually a variable in a hurricane that can be measured with a fairly decent accuracy. You can measure the sustained winds in a hurricane even when it's out to sea. The hurricane hunters travel over the top of the hurricane and drop probes down into the middle, and they can measure all kinds of variables. You really can't do that in a tornado because one, it's too short-lived to have the capacity to really measure those variables in any kind of detail, and they're so small in scale that it's really difficult to get a very accurate measurement of wind speed or humidity or temperature or pressure or any of these other variables that you might construct a scale out of. In fact, that was the whole concept of the movie in the 90s, Twister, was that they were trying to figure out a way of measuring some of these variables. And we really haven't had too much success, even in the last 20 years, of trying to get really accurate measurements of a lot of these variables, particularly with maybe every single tornado that ever, ever makes contact with the ground surface. It's been possible on a couple of different occasions to get maybe some probes embedded up in a tornado, and it takes some measurements but that still doesn't allow us to understand every single tornado. Okay, so with all those limitations in mind, with the idea that you essentially can't really measure something like wind speed or pressure, temperature, humidity inside a tornado, 
The only way we have of being able to rank tornadoes and to classify them is by the destruction that they cause. So this is an intensity-based scale. It's called the Fujita scale. Or really, more in the last 20 years, we've moved on to something called the Enhanced Fujita Scale, where you use computer modeling to try to predict what kind of damage a particular tornado will be capable of doing. So this is going to be tied back to wind speed, but it's very important to note that the scale is not based on wind speed. It's based on the damage that it's causing, because you can't actually take an accurate measurement of wind speed. So I'm going to show you uh, the full spectrum of what tornadoes can do according to the Fujita scale. We'll start with the very smallest of tornadoes, the ones that are going to be um, associated with the um, higher pressures and the lower wind speeds. That's going to be an F0. And then we go on to F1, F2, and all the way up to F5. F5 is going to be the worst of this whole scale of Fujita um, uh, tornadoes. So the way that I'm going to show this is by wreaking havoc and destruction on this cute little Oklahoma farmhouse. Do not get attached to the picture on the slide here, or of the little garage, or the car, or the playset, or this hypothetical family that might live in this little cute um, farmhouse in Oklahoma, because we're going to utterly decimate it with one tornado after another. We're going to start with the F0 tornado. An F0 tornado is basically the smallest one there is. And even that low down on the scale, you have wind speeds associated with either a strong tropical storm or a uh, weak hurricane. So anywhere from uh, a fairly advanced tropical storm to maybe a category one hurricane. The wind speeds that would be associated with an F0 uh, tornado would be somewhere along the line of 65 to 85 mile per hour wind speeds. So that's pretty significant. And again, I just want to remind you at this point that we're not basing the scale off the wind speeds because we can't measure those wind speeds. We're estimating the wind speeds based on the damage that was done in this computer model. So you can see the aftermath of this tornado behind the house here, the shingles torn off the roof of the house, probably a lot of windows burst out by the change in pressure and by the wind speeds, some limbs gone from the trees, and a lot of damage to the garage. Maybe that little, you know, um, playground structure in the yard might be in a different point in the yard, might be upside down at this point, but the structure as a whole is still intact. And that's basically the same effect that you might get with a land falling uh, category one hurricane. You might have that same sort of level of destruction, not taking into account things like storm surge. So let's move on from this. If you think this is bad, it's only going to get substantially worse. In an F1 tor um, a tornado, you have upwards of hurricane category 2 to category 3 wind speeds. So it's going to rapidly really increase. This is still acting over a fairly small house, and we're assuming that this tornado hit this house and hit this whole area directly. Now the garage is a complete mess. It's basically experiencing total structural failure. The playground equipment is nowhere to be seen. Let's assume it's over in the neighbor's yard somewhere. You have trees actually down and you have major structural damage to the roof and to the, the house. Um, all the shingles are gone. So you have quite a bit more damage associated with an F1 than an F0. In an F2, you're getting up to solidly category three hurricane wind speeds and upwards close to category four wind speeds. But this is only an F2 tornado on a five point scale. So 111 to 135 mile per hour winds means you are going to completely just rip the roof off of this house. All the trees are going to be down. The garage is no longer. The garage has completely flattened. The car is upside down. And you are uh, you know basically have what you would consider to be total devastation to this house, except it can get a lot worse with more advanced tornadoes. So F3, you basically almost have no house left. You have only this very small sort of internal structure of this house remaining. The garage is, is unidentifiable anymore. And with an F3 tornado, you're basically already at 
Category 5 hurricane wind speeds. And Category 5 hurricane is, of course, the worst of those category hurricanes. 155 mile per hour winds is the cutoff for a Category 5 hurricane. And we're only at F3 for tornadoes. F4 tornado, and there's absolutely no structure of the house remaining. There's just debris scattered all over the place. And then finally, when you get to F5 tornadoes, these have over 200 mile per hour wind speeds. There's essentially nothing but the slab remaining of what used to be this house, and all of the debris is scattered out for miles and miles and miles. We haven't had, at least, um, at least in a very, very long time, a, a tornado of this intensity in Louisiana, but in places like Joplin, Missouri, in places um, mainly out in, the, in um, the, the west to midwest, you've certainly had um, F5 tornadoes in the past few years. So the supercell tornadoes, to take this back into the types of thunderstorms that are going to be capable of spawning these tornadoes, it's going to be the supercell tornadoes that are associated with the really, really high intensity um, um, tornadoes. The ones that are going to be associated with the supercell thunderstorm are going to have that internal rotation. And that means that they're going to be stronger in a sense. You're going to have the capacity for higher wind speeds. And probably most importantly to the damage that they're capable of doing, these end up being longer lived. So the F3, F4, F5 tornadoes, these are almost impossible without some sort of supercell uh, thunderstorm. The really scary thing involved in hurricanes is that particularly the outer bands of thunderstorms and hurricanes are essentially small little supercell thunderstorms. So they too have the capacity of dropping down tornadoes. It's possible to get non-supercell tornadoes, which we'll talk about in just a minute. In those supercell tornadoes, what we think might be associated with the actual drop of these tornadoes down to the ground surface, and what's often been witnessed, is this cold air moving down from the upper atmosphere actually in some cases punching a hole through the cloud and then wrapping around this warm, humid air on the ground surface. And this allows this rotation to tighten and actually make contact from the wall cloud down to the Earth's surface. At least as far as what I'm familiar with, that cold downdraft is going to be one of the only precursors that you can actually witness on the ground surface. That's actually going to trigger that supercell rotation, that mesocyclone, with actually connecting down with the ground surface. You do also have non-supercell tornadoes. Um, so these are going to be still associated with thunderstorms, but not supercell thunderstorms. But these typically end up being very, very low in intensity. These end up being just these very small land spouts and water spouts. The land spouts are going to essentially be these non supercell uh, thunderstorms traveling over some sort of rotation on the ground surface and then having that rotation spawn a very, very short-lived tornado. Then once they're no longer on that center of rotation on the Earth's surface, then that's when the tornado dissipates. So these are tornadoes that might be around for minutes instead of hours and their capacity to actually do a significant amount of damage, even though you still have those fairly high wind speeds, is very much diminished because because of how long these things last. A water spout is essentially the same thing as a land spout. Of course, it obviously, as the name would indicate, forms over the water. It's very, very common to get these over Lake Pontchartrain, over the Gulf of Mexico, and for these to be visible on the land surface. I don't want to lull anybody into a false sense of complacency, but because these are tied back to a rotation on the ground surface, like the land spouts, the capacity of these things to actually be long lasting is uh, relatively difficult. I actually want to leave you with this picture, uh, or this video taken in March of this year, of three water spouts over Lake Pontchartrain. This was captured by uh, the WWL team in, in New Orleans. They actually have three water spouts um, visible from the Mandeville Lakefront, and they dissipated before they actually reached land, so they didn't do any um, damage. But it was probably pretty scary to uh, behold at the time. It was certainly scary to watch on TV as I did at that time. 
The thing that we're going to talk about in the next lecture is going to be hurricanes. Hurricanes are probably the most important meteorological topic for us to talk about, particularly here in South Louisiana. So I think it's going to be a particularly interesting one. We'll uh, talk about Hurricane Katrina and other hurricanes that have made landfall here in Louisiana. So definitely tune in next time. Until then, keep looking up. Thank you.